Today, a spotlight on Wollongong property. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. There's something weird about social media, but occasionally I get quite a few questions about the same subject at the same time. And one of the ones that's really come up quite often is what's happening in and around Wollongong, particularly with regard to property prices. In fact, a number of people have claimed that the centre is booming and that prices are going through the roof and the sales volumes are way high. Well, I'm afraid that my analysis, which I'm going to go through now, doesn't quite tell that story. It tells a rather different story. So today I'm going to step through some of my analysis relating to property in and around Wollongong. And just before we start, I should add that this information is not in any way to be regarded as financial advice. This is purely my analysis based on the data that I've collected from my surveys and other sources. And of course, the information will change as things change. But nevertheless, I think this is quite an important subject. And it's important to try and get as much rounded data as possible. And frankly, just going to the property portals and going from there or quoting high level prices just doesn't cut the mustard. And I might also just add that we are drawing data from our core market model where we survey our households on an ongoing rolling basis. And we pull in information from a lot of other sources too to be able to form a view as to what's going on. And it's that comprehensive analysis that we then feed into our blog, into our YouTube channels, and of course, into our one-to-one -one conversations where we speak with individuals about a particular postcode and share our insights. But what it does allow us to do is to take our mortgage stress information, the home price trajectory data, the buying and selling intention data from our surveys, the migration statistics, and broader economic information such as CPI wages and employment, and flow that through our core market model. And of course, we also overlay our scenarios, both positive and less positive. And we can do that at a postcode level, rolling it up to a state, a region, and all Australian level. And that then gives us a footprint, which makes some suggestions about where prices may go in the next two or three years. So today I'm looking at postcode 2500, which essentially covers the immediate vicinity of Wollongong and just slightly further inland as well. And I'm going to be looking at both houses and units and we'll start with looking at what's for sale. And the data shows that there is quite a high level of property listings on the market at the moment, close to 150. And that's quite a big number. And here's a few examples. You'll see there that there's houses and apartments on the market. And some of them go to auction. And some of them are on the market at a guide price. And the price ranges vary quite considerably with apartments in some cases well over the $1 million mark. Whereas other apartments are in the 270 to 400 mark. And it's worth saying the predominant accommodation style in Wollongong is apartments these days. More about that a bit later. And I would make the point that in some cases there's a buyer's guide price, in other cases there's a range, and in some cases uh, there's an auction. It does depend. And it's worth saying that in some cases they show an inside view rather than an outside view as their T's slide. And that's sometimes because outside things don't look quite as flash. So the next part of our analysis is how many properties have sold. And we think there's around 56 that have sold in the last couple of months. And you can see them shown on the map. And there's quite a consistent pattern where the portals are reporting last asking price. Now the last asking price, of course, does not necessarily reflect the settlement price. It's worth noting because sometimes the portals are very slow to get the settlement data through. And here again, some more apartments are sold as well as houses. 
So now let's turn to current price trends. And I'm going to look at units in Wollongong first. Now this is my median home price chart from 2013. And you can see there that back in 2013, the median price was around $410,000. Today, it's $550,000. But if you look at the trajectory between 2013 to 2020, you can see that there were some years, like in 2015 and 2017, where prices on average rose consistently. 15.3% in 2015 and 11.4% in 2017. And in fact, prices reached a peak in 2017 of $585,000. But since then, in 2018, they slipped a little. In 2019, they slipped some more. And so far in 2020, they're flat. So if you bought back in 2017, you could well be in negative equity now if you have a big mortgage. And overall, if you look at the average gain from 2013 to 2020, that's 4.3% or 2.4% after inflation. But that's all to do with gains in the earlier part of the decade. Now, one source of information which I turn to very often is the value of general data. And this shows all settled properties in the particular location. This is units. And you can see that there's quite a long list of properties that settled over the last few months and that the price ranges do vary from, you know, 1.8 to 2.3 million down to 455, 453, 415, 490. And that's a warning, of course. That means that medium prices always tend to be somewhere in the middle but it doesn't necessarily tell you too much about the spread of prices. And there will be the odd property that went very high and others that probably sold well below average. Nevertheless, I think the median is the least worst way of trying to measure what's going on. Let's look at houses now in the same area. And there, back in 2013, the average house price was $500,000. Today, it's $895,000. But again, you can see that in 2014 and 2016, there were very significant rises. Some rises too in 2017, but since then in 2018, it went up in median terms by 0.6%. In 2019, up 2.8% and down so far in 2020 by 3.2%. And once again, that shows us that whilst the average gain is 8.3% or 6.4% after inflation, it's all about those earlier years. Since 2018, where prices hit an all-time high, they've gone pretty much nowhere at all. And once again, we can look at the value of general data, which shows the sales between October 2019 and October 2020. And of course, again, purchase prices do vary. As you would expect. But there are some pretty large numbers, over 2 million, over 3 million. And there's one there at 9.5 million. But I think we need to be a little bit careful about that particular property, because if you look at it, it's a very large area. So that may not be very representative. That's why the median helps to iron out some of the outliers. Now, I will just quickly look at Coniston, which is just inland from Wollongong Harbour. And there, prices were 295,000 back in 2013 to 495,000 in 2020. This is for units. And the average gain is 8.3% or 6.4% after inflation. And once again, you can see that 2015 was clearly a strong year as was 2017. There was growth in 2018, but there were slides in 2016, 2019, and a rise in 2020. As a result, the gain is 8.3% over those periods, or 6.4% after inflation. Now, there are less transactions in that particular part of 2500, and they're all listed there. But you can see there that units are typically 
somewhere between 400 and 600,000. And we can do the same for houses. And once again, we find that back in 2013, $385,000 was the average price. It's grown to $650,000 now in 2020 in median terms. But that 2015 and 2016 and 2017 were where a lot of the growth was. Since then, 2018 only grew 5.1%. It fell by 10% in 2019, and it's just up very slightly so far in 2020. As a result, the total gain is 7.7%, whilst the after inflation number is 5.7%. And once again, the value of general data shows that there's quite a range of houses from a million dollars down to prices closer to 400,000. Now, if I can then summarize generally the postcode, there are around 320 listings there at the moment with 100 added in the past month. That's quite a large number of new properties coming onto the market. Back in May 2019, listings were similar at 320. And there are around 21% of properties as houses, the rest are units. Now, for gross yields from a rental perspective for houses, it's sitting at around 3.5%. And that's a slide from 3.9% last year. The net yield is around 2.05% and is falling. Whereas Gross yields on units is around 3.9%, and that's the same as last year at 3.9%. And the net yield is slightly higher than for houses at 2.75% and is steady. Now, of course, those yields are not corrected for inflation. If you add inflation in two, the net yields are still not very flash, and quite a few people are in negative yield on a cash flow basis. The rents for houses are rising slightly, up 3% in the last quarter, with a typical rent of 530 per week. Whilst the rents for units are rising up 4% over the past quarter, with a typical rent of $440 per week. The vacancy rates are sitting at currently around 1.6%, compared with 2.2% in mid-May 2019. And there are around 160 vacancies currently reported, compared with 220 last year. Turning to asking prices on houses, they're actually flat at the moment with a typical house price of around $780,000. And the average settlement comes in at around 4% lower than the asking price. And asking prices on units are rising slightly up 1.5% over the past quarter with a typical unit price of $575,000. And the average settlement is 6% lower than asking. And the intention to sell is rising slightly. Now, we can also look at our mortgage stress data. And what I've done here is I've pulled the information out for 2500, and I've also put it up for 2300, which is the area around Newcastle, because I'm often asked about the relativities between those two postcodes. And you can see there that in 2500, there's about 18,700 households. There are around 4,300 borrowing, 11,000 renting, 8,500 properties for rent, and the overall financial stress metric is sitting at 60%, which is quite high compared with many other parts of New South Wales. And to make that point, the financial stress statistic for Newcastle is just 27%, with 6,200 households there, 1,300 borrowing, 4,100 renting, and around 3,100 properties for rent. If we look at homeowners, there are around 1,100 in mortgage stress. That's the mild variety of stress, plus 645 in severe stress in Wollongong. And that puts an overall stress metric there at 42%, which is higher than the national average. Whereas if you go up to Newcastle, there, we've got 993 in mortgage stress, none in severe stress, but that's 75% of households. So the stress has a different profile and is more widespread. As a result, the defaults at 3% are slightly higher than in Wollongong at 2%. If you look at rental stress, another big difference between the two, in 2500 rental stress, there's around 5,800 renters in financial difficulty, that's 52%. Whereas there's only 379 up in that Newcastle postcode, which is 
And finally, we look at property investors. These are people who have a property investment, but not necessarily in this postcode, but they live in this postcode. And there are 3,600 stressed investors, of which 645 are severely stressed, which translates to 55% of property investors living in 2500 in difficulty. And that compares to 328, or 23%, up in Newcastle. And the other thing I've done is just plotted my mid-price scenario for the two postcodes. So the lighter blue is Newcastle, the darker colour is Wollongong. And you can see there that over three years my mid-case is still for more price corrections in Wollongong. And deeper falls relative to Newcastle. And then we can look at our price scenario for Wollongong. And the way to read this chart is that we have our different scenarios. In the best case scenario where the virus is under control and all of the economic stimulus works and we get the economy back quickly and unemployment drops dramatically. In that scenario we could see prices drop just a few percent next year and then pretty much hold their values. On the other hand, if we get more virus, if we have deeper economic issues, if the international borders remain shut for the next year or two, then the scenario is more like a 15% fall next year and perhaps even a 30% fall over three years. Now I take my midpoint, my base case, and in that base case, the dotted line, we're looking at about a 17% fall overall for property in Wollongong. Now what happens, of course, is that that then gets translated to both units and houses, but not to the same extent. So we can then display our projections for Wollongong units, which is for another fall, 13% fall over the next year, and then small falls the next two years to bring prices back to where they were in 2015. On the other hand, houses look as though the falls will be much less noticeable, down 7.9% over the next year, and then just 3% and 1.8%, taking prices back to where they were in 2017. Whereas if you look at Coniston there, again for units, we do see another fall over the next year, down 13%, followed by 5% and 3%, and that would take prices back to where they were in 2019. And finally, Coniston Houses shows a small fall in 2021, then a further small fall in 2022, and then a very minor fall in 2023, to take prices back to where they were in 2016. Now, I should say, if you have a more positive view of the economy and the government stimulus, then of course those falls are overstated. But I have updated the information based on the latest information I have available, and will continue to refresh that data each month. So the point I really want to leave you with when looking at Wollongong is that there is still quite a supply of properties coming onto the market, that prices are not roaring away at the moment, and indeed transaction volumes are still relatively quiet compared with where they were last year or the year before. So there is very little sign here of a property market that is really roaring away, and I see that pretty consistently across many regional centres where people are claiming that the market is recovered and is going to new highs. Haven't seen that yet in Wollongong, haven't seen it yet in many other places. And so in conclusion, I will simply say again, when you are analysing property, it's important to go granular, get all the information from multiple sources, and then really understand what is going on. These high level numbers tell you nothing, and indeed can be deeply misleading. And many of the property portals are still presenting information with just the upside and the positive story without telling the full story. So buyer, beware, as always, do the work, do the research, and be cautious and careful at this uncertain time. And just before I go, a quick reminder that on Tuesday at 8 p.m. Sydney time, I'll be running my next live stream, and there I'll be discussing my latest scenarios and also looking at mortgage stress, rental stress, and investor stress. And I'll have my postcode tool online so we can look at individual postcodes, if that's what you want to do. So I look forward to seeing you then. 
I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.